Welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce to episode three of Engine for Art, Democracy and Justice. I'm Susan Edwards, director and CEO of the First Art Museum. EADJ is a trans-institutional collaboration involving four Nashville, Tennessee institutions, Fisk University, Frist Art Museum, Millions of Conversations, and Vanderbilt University. This vibrant series of discussions living in the common, living in common in the precarious South examines the consequences of social and historical inequities on the Southern imaginary and presents a platform for developing academic, creative, and social exploration of the past to inspire understanding and action based on reciprocity and to devise strategic pathways for reconciliation. Today's episode features artists Rena Banerjee, Audubon Nganga, and Theastra Gates. This panel titled Paths of Emerging Solidarities is moderated by Frist Start Museum Chief Curator Mark Scala. Franklin Sermons, Director of the Press Art Museum is our respondent. The Frist Start Museum is honored and excited to participate in this historic endeavor initiated by Vanderbilt University Cornelius Vanderbilt Endowed Chair, Professor Maria Magdalena Campos Pons and curated by Marina Fakitas, Head of the Artistic Office in Athens and curatorial advisor to Documenta 14. She is also editor in chief of the journal, South as a State of Mind. If you are able, I invite you to the Frist Art Museum where Rena Banerjee, Make Me a Summary of the World, an exhibition co-organized by the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, Philadelphia and the San Jose Museum of Art, California opens this Friday, October 9th. Please welcome Professor Maria Magdalena Campos Pons. Welcome everyone and thank you, Susan. I am fishing you out from the soil of ancestral lineage of indigenous people with energy and life story fuel our life today. To my ancestor, permission to reach you all, to address you all, and to give light and direction to this gathering. The episode Solidarity invite us to think in our common responsibilities and our common destinies. It is in the core of EADJ. As I come to you, I come with perhaps an ontological discrepancy and an ontological question. I'm thinking as an artist, in the invitation of Khan in the allure of the one, of the individual. And I think as well as an artist in the invitation from Thomas McEvely to sing in the proposition that I am is the bent soul. Or should I take Cantanian soul and McEvely proposition? I want to sing and place into your hand to sing together that I am is only what we are. That in the understanding of we are is that we could build that I am. If I am the air, then we are the universe. If I am the miniature, then we are the gigant. If my well is what I am, then our common well is what propose us forward. It is important that we think in those terms in this particular time. Collaboration and the generosity of the courage to set the oneself to the side, to invite the others, is a fundamental idea for this episode. The artists that we invited here are extraordinary example of those gestures. So to my fellow and colleague artists, thank you for being here. To Marina, the curator, I give the floor now to speak with more details about solidarity when it's most needed in the state of the world today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Magda. 
it's always so hard to take the microphone from you and with your wonderful words. But thank you for making us part of your vision and giving us uh, the chance to walk together in the challenging and gratifying paths that brings us here today. Thank you to all the team that worked so hard behind the scenes and in front of the scenes and for our wonderful collaboration. Thank you above all to our speakers and to our guests whose practice has been informing us much beyond the time frame of this webinar and has somehow influenced us and inspired us to do this program. The gratitude is immense, the, the time frame is very small and the list is huge. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Today, um, instead of another kind of um, introduction, I want to follow, I want to report on something very uh, important that happened in Athens, a historical moment and a kind of an um, example that gives us courage to go on with this emerging paths of solidarity. Today, the 7th of October, 2020, amidst the pandemic, more than 30,000 people gathered in front of the Athens courthouse and welcome a verdict which convicted the neo-fascist, neo-Nazi party Golden Dawn as a criminal organization. Together with, them, with this, the members of the party was also convicted for first degree murder against Pakistani fruit worker Sazam Lukman, against Pablo Spisas, a popular anti-fascist hip hop artist, against Eg Egyptians, fishermen, and many other people of which we don't know yet. Today, a bunch of openly uh, Holocaust deniers, admirers of Hitler, and violent haters who managed once to be elected were finally um, accused as criminal. Uh, the hearing has been the biggest trial of the neo-fascists since the prosecution of the Nazis at Nuremberg after the Second World War. The victory is big. It's huge, uh, primarily in a symbolic level. In 2012, amidst, amidst the Greek uh, crisis, Golden Dawn was voted by half a million people in Greece and elected 18 MPs in the Greek parliament. Today, in 2020, after them, been killing, after them having been killing people that they didn't agree with their visions, they're convicted as criminals. How has this happened? Through love. The love of, ma of the mother of Pavlos Fisas, Magda Fisa, the mother of all who, after losing her son, dedicated, decided to dedicate herself to the struggle for justice. She initiated and led a court case which lasted six years. Together, she initiated also a solidarity group for justice, which managed to gather all the cases of uh, people, of the victims together, and immense support. How has this happened? Through solidarity, led by Magda Fisa, the struggle got a lot of attention, both nationally and internationally. A big network of solidarity was based, shaped on empathy and resonance. A network that goes beyond ethnicity, beyond cultural identity, beyond sexual orientation, beyond financial status. A network that managed to gather all who genuinely strive for justice and brought thousands of people in the streets today. How has this happened? Through persistence and resistance, living by the courage of this lady, Magda Fisa, this mother, and the, for her, the chance of giving up was just, was just not an alternative. Magda Fisa has not left the streets for seven years today. Through these years, she was joined by many uh, people, among others, also art organizations and members of the art world, forensic architectures, a multidisciplinary research group based at the University of London, uh, Goldsmiths College, that uses architectural and uh, techniques and technologies to investigate cases of state of violence or uh, violations of human rights, work along her. And also us in Documenta 14 had the honor to host her and her association in the, our concluding event in September 18th, 2017, which is also the day that her son died uh, five, uh, four years ago in 2013, and bring her in touch with other associations of victims in Germany of racist murders and the known case NSU, but in Germany, unfortunately, the case didn't have the same uh, verdict as in Greece. 
there, the files closed for eight years, 80, 80 years. The conviction, the conviction today is vital if we are to end the fascist threat. And we hope that the decision will send very important messages to the far right in Europe and around the world. The judgment was met with, was met with joy and felicitations in the streets and the applause of people are still echoing in my heart and in my head. Difficulties call for resistance and for persistence. And here we are in this path that Magda Campos Pons, our Magda, uh, brought us today in her dreams, walking her, to her dreams and following her vision to follow a little public sphere of resistance, of emerging paths of solidarities and start the engine for our democracy and justice. Here we are addressing the living in common in the precarious South. This is how we respond to the popularity of the ultra-right authoritarian national governmental morphologies that spread around the world like fires in a wooden house. And with no further ado, I'd like, I have the honor to introduce you or to pass the microphone to Mark Scala, the chief curator of First Museum, who will lead the conversation. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mark. Thank you, Marina, for that lovely commentary and very sobering commentary. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. The program seems particularly necessary in light of the news from Athens, which while good, as Marina notes, confirms that white supremacy is actively forging its own path toward a very dangerous global attack on solidarity. The arts and humanities are on the front line opposing this. But as we'll, as we'll discuss today with three artists who have been in the long game, this isn't just for this moment of crisis. This is a continuing effort. This is a multi transgenerational effort. Implying physical and creative movement toward a common humanity, paths of emerging solidarities evokes the trajectory of art as an engine toward wider action, fulfilling art historian Herbert Reed's statement that, I quote, art must lead beyond the arts to an awareness and a share of mutuality. So we've invited three leading artists whose aesthetics can be approached through the Debordian concept of psychogeography. Each might find an echo in Gloria Anzaldúa's counsel, Voyagers, there are no bridges. One builds them as one walks. We welcome Rena Banerjee, who was born in Calcutta, but has lived in the US most of her life, examining dislocation, double consciousness, and subliminal codes of language. Rena explores the relationship between fixed and unfixed identities. As Susan mentioned, her retrospective, Make Me a Summary of the World, which was brilliantly curated by Lauren Shell Dickens and Jody Throckmorton, uh, opens this Friday at the Frist. We'll be very happy to see you here. Also with us is Nigerian artist Otabong Nkanga, based in Antwerp. Otabong has exhibited at the Venice Biennale, MCA Chicago, the Stedelijk, Tate, and elsewhere. In tapestries, paintings, performances, and videos, she poetically calls out the exploitation and extraction of resources around the world, from Cornwall to Namibia. A special thanks to Bonaventure, who last week mentioned her work as an example of a monument going from convexity, the erection, with all the masculinity that implies, to concavity, the wound in the earth. Otterbong addresses the economics of depletion, labor, consumption, and destruction. How these, separate, how these separate humanity from the natural world in metaphors of dismemberment, scarification, and reconnectedness. And at the end of our talk, we're thrilled to be able to present one of Autobong's most powerful videos, which she will introduce for us. And finally, Theaster Gates, with a background in pottery and urban planning, a practice in installation and performance, rejuvenating archival materials, employing space theory and land development, and as a musician, Theaster embodies the notion of artist as voyager and bridge maker. Since 2010, he has, worked to, he has worked to reclaim his neighborhood in Chicago's South Side through the Rebuild Foundation, a nonprofit platform targeting neighborhood regeneration, community arts programming, and cultural development. And we're extremely lucky to have Theaster with us today because he opens his show Black Vessel at Gagosian this week. And congratulations to Theaster for that. And as our respondent, we're honored to have Franklin Sermons. Franklin is the director of the Perez Art Museum, Miami, 
a leader in the presentation of exhibitions and programs that reinforce the role of art in shaping global consciousness. At PAM, Franklin has pursued his vision of the People's Museum, making numerous acquisitions from around the globe and strengthening the fund for African-American art, the International Women's Committee, and the Latin American and Latinx Art Fund. So if we could go to the uh, first slide, please. In my view, one central force linking these artists is a quest for solidarity. In the quest for solidarity, is that a beauty? A word that once seemed antithetical to social critique because of its association with pleasure, but now may be seen as a seduction, even a weapon. Can beauty provide a path to solidarity? I'm thinking of this quote from Elaine Scarry's book on beauty and being just. Beautiful things give rise to the notion of distribution, to a life-saving reciprocity, to fairness, not just in the sense of loveliness of aspect, but in the, in the sense of a symmetry of everyone's relation to one another. I'd like to start with Rena. Rena, you once asked whether authenticity can exist for the artists of the diaspora. And then you make works of such exceptional beauty and sometimes grotesqueness that seem to move the question of authenticity toward another kind of measure. How does Scary's symmetry of everyone's relation to one another come to play in works like When Signs of Origin Fade? Mark, it's a very important question that has always come up in defining uh, my work, which is authenticity, to be able to create an identity that is simple, explicit, and transparent is not possible when exploring one's own identity. We are all in part in places where we don't live. We're all connected by this one body that is the human body. And this human body stretches to origins as the title of this work suggests to fade when distance is maintained. And so the separations we have that create a kind of blurriness we name as diaspora, we must realize that we are everywhere and we are everything. There was a lot of interest in displaying my identity as an artist as only Indian or only American. But in reality, the origins of my own identity come from many places because I'm human and I'm part of nature. The works that are uh, created in these three sculptures that I'll share with you, talk about this reach, this ability to transcend the oneness and the simplicity of oneness. Authenticity in some sense is a violence against this connection, this connection which is natural, which is here, which is invisible, which needs to be reached. And I think the solidarity that we're looking for creates a hope for a certain beauty that exists already. And the works uh, when signs of origin fade refer to the main land that floats on the earth on oceans, the middle body, the only body, which is nature's body, which is our body has these ear-like projections that are shells, seashells. Um, the face creates a mask, a mask that can be exchanged, can mimic, can be displaced, can see everything and be everything. So the acting that requires, that allows us to communicate, to learn each other's language is a very important part of our growth and the violence that's created when we do separate. And this piece in creating the many fruits, which are gourds that you see on the left screen, talk about this fruit of exchange to become one again. When the lands of Pangea, which was once one land, come together as they are right now, we realize the importance of visibility 
and the visibility of this oneness comes out of only solar solidarity and not estrangement. I think the foreign in the US as we speak of today has this kind of largeness that is unsurmountable. Everyone is foreign and no one can be at home when foreign is laid to begin again. So I think identities that come to uh, speak to each other must realize that identity itself is a passageway to that oneness and that friendship that comes out of exchange and movement. So my work also has this kind of um, thread that is everywhere, that is uncontainable, that is like rain, that precipitates, that drags, that lingers, that remembers, um, and I think those threads also are true about our uh, culture as a whole. So the illegitimacy that is placed on the foreign is about our fears of our, who we are as a complex human being and a complex nature. And the works that um, in the next slides, if you see the sculptures that are created really talk about our fear of disease and how disease is sometimes used as a metaphor to dehumanize um, those people who we feel are the disease, are not human. And I think that's really important to understand in terms of the mixing that we hope for, that when things become messy, chaotic, they really speak of real truth, of reality, and we begin to open our senses to more than our own language, what we are familiar with, what in, in many terms are noted as exotic. The exotic is a place of containment that is also a violence of distance, of remoteness. And it's very important for us to understand that this whole system that is nature in itself as an incubator is a digestive place. And it is a place of understanding and nourishing ourselves of what is there in the world. And I think with this, I'm really talking about this kind of air that we breathe that is both water, other people. And when we stop breathing this air, we become really a dying breed. And I think that is the threat of what is to come if we don't come together. Um, this work, which is in breathless confinement, talks about being wooden, being uncertain, and the dangers of coming out of that containment. And it talks about also the joy of being what I call jungle or jungle. Um, and I think those things are really the beginnings of the understanding of everything that is possible in understanding identity not as a static or fixed place, but a thing that actually moves and breathes as continents drift apart and come together. So the next details of these works really talk about the splitting. And so you have this form and its form kind of springs out like fruit from a tree and in the back, all those things that are connected to everything else remains connected in movement forward. This, the sculpture here really talks about the digestive system as well as a breathing place, so an intestinal place which reaches out to take nourishment from other people. And so the commerce that I talk about, talk about contradictions of currency, who we devalue and value, being an ongoing conversation between places and things and products that come out of nature and manufacturing. My works really seek to blend the past that is ancient, the future that isn't here yet, and those things in the present that are rejected from a place we call the contemporary art world. And this mixing recreates a garden that I call sometimes a foreign garden conceptually in my work. 
the narrative is always growing and it can never be static in the way I see it to form an idea of what is living is everywhere. And so these branching and the droppings that you see in the works that come to the floor is something that I come to um, a lot. There's a certain ethereal and floating quality about what is monumental in my work and what becomes a thing that is hard to preserve. And so I use textiles to create the body in those um, conversation. I use seashells and uh, remains of the body like feathers and hair and eyelashes to reference all that that comes apart, that leaves our body that we shed. Thank you, thank you for that, Rena. That's really, I, the work is so extraordinary and it seems so timely, especially when we're talking about in breathless confinement with its migration metaphors. Um, migration metaphors are really acute today in a world brimming with movement and cultural intersections. And so this leads me to uh, move to Autobahn and ask Autobahn about her desire to, in her words, connect our histories to see how each different culture has informed the other. This projects a bodily geography very much aligned with Rena's in terms of dismemberment, intersectionality, and reconstruction. Autobahn, please provide a sense of your work. What is important to you? How rooted is it in geography? How necessary is beauty? And how do you materialize a new sense of connectedness? Thank you so much for this um, talk and being invited to this program. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes, okay. Um, so thanks Mark for your question. Um, I think I will start with thinking or to open up a place of thinking about what is a support system or what is a support structure. And, um, and within the work or what I make um, or the different projects that have been in place, it's to really think through how can one create a system or structure that can be supportive in different ways. So here we have an image which is really talking about the beginning of the project I started um, in 2017 in Documenta um, in Athens and in Castle. And I was very much interested in thinking of that idea of how can one create a thing that will be able to feed its own self, that will be able to expand to, through different geographies and will able to connect and make us think about different geographies. So you ask a question about beauty. And for me, I see beauty as something that is a weapon that is um, at the same time that could be something that could unite, but also something that could allow for the separation of things. So we can imagine of a place that is being excavated, a place that is being, um, um, how do you say, broken down, that is uh, affected by different kinds of pollution or extracted minerals and materials and what that does to that place. Um, and so I, I, of course, think of a place like the, the of Bengal one in the 17th century or the 18th, 19th century, what happened with regards to the landscape that was completely depleted um, due to the extractions that had to take place in that place. And what happens when all the elements are taken out and what happens to the beauty and the connection of people to a place. So I was interested in looking at the combination of the body, the place, people, the economy, and the materials that we can take out of there. So I think it's good to go to the next image. So I think I'll let this video talk for a while about the project capture flow before I move further on into other details of the work. So we can start the video. Capture flow is a support structure inspired from African architecture, especially the Musgum architecture carving, sculpting, to allow the flow of things. Each unit is connected 
and they support each other. Carve to Flow has been created in multiple phases. The first phase, which took place in Athens, Greece, as part of Documenta 14 in 2017, allowed for the creation of a sculpture, a cold process soap called O8 Blackstone, made of seven oils, butters, lye, and charcoal. The installation took a form of a soap making laboratory where people could witness the process of making different recipes, attend events, and discuss cent discussions centered around soils, oils, economies, and movements of goods and people, curated by Maya Tunta. The second phase of the project, which took place in Kassel, Germany, also in 2017, involved the storage and selling of 15,008 black stone soaps made by soap makers with Oliveira in Kalamata, Greece. The soaps were sold through the performers during the period of Documenta 14. With Carter Flow, the understanding of the shift from soils, trees, oils, soaps, and money would lead to the third phase germination, which would see the transformation of the profit into the creation of a foundation and an art space. Due to the versatile way in which the work regards the idea of a support structure, the work becomes a proposal for an alternative system of care. The third phase of Carve to Flow will see the art space in Aquibum open in Athens, Greece, by the end of 2019. Carve to Flow will be able to take care of infrastructural needs of the space, which will be headed by the curator and writer Maya Tunta. The aim of the space will be to host exhibitions, workshops, and artistic gatherings. Aquibum which is the name of the art space in Athens, Greece, is also the name of the Nigerian state where Carve to Flow Foundation is based. The Carve to Flow Foundation has been registered since 2017 and two lands of 3,000 square meters and another one of 1,000 square meters have been acquired to be able to create a biodiverse garden with plants that have medicinal properties or form part of the local material cultures. The aim of the foundation will be to archive local knowledges around crafts and to transmit these knowledges to younger generations, to preserve, develop, and also cultivate deep connections with the landscape. That's such a beautiful video. It tells us so much. Uh, and you've got some more images that you will share with us about Carve to Flow, yes? Yes, so I will start by um, where the ideas were starting from and the idea of the karyatids. We can move to the next image. I think we could go through the images slowly. And I was really um, interested when I went to Athens and I noticed the, the, I visited a lot of architectural structures and also thinking about the notion of Europe and what that meant, the whitening of all the marbles and using that whiteness to be able to think about the construction or the building of Europe. But at the same time, when you visit this architecture, you would see that the marble is not white and that the marble has been stained by different elements over time. And actually, when you look at marble, it's not definitely totally um, white itself. But um, I was interested in the karyatid pot of the Erection in Athens to be able to think through the notion of a support system. So the column and the beam. And that what, that's what brought me to the place of thinking about the work um, of, of carve to flow that could one actually create something where one thing supports the other. But at the same time, I had to think of the time in 2016 when I was thinking about this project and creating the project, this was a time of Brexit. This was a time when um, you see a lot of these pillars or what uh, and systems falling apart in the world. So it, it brought me to think about 
what kind of architectural structure will be the way of thinking through about life. And for me, that brought me back again to African architecture and African traditional architecture. And that was interesting when I started looking at um, Muscoom architecture and to understand how it's not about the pillar and the beam, but it's about how different bubbles connect together or different structures, circular structures connect together and create chains. And those chains are facing inward in the courtyard where um, they, they, the courtyard becomes a place of a conversation. Um, but at the same time, I started thinking of also people leaving and fleeing from um, different parts of the world and coming through Athens, coming through Greece. And it made me think about the carrying of life and what it means to carry life. So we can move to the next um, image. And that was important for me to um, think about a project that will be able to sustain itself. Um, and we have now opened the space in Athens, which is called the Quibom. And this space in Athens is being sustained by the uh, money that was brought in by the um, sales of the soap and, and has also opened up the possibility of doing things in Nigeria um, with, the, um, with the foundation. And now we're working a lot in relation to the COVID situation that is going on um, in, in Nigeria or in Abuja and in um, Uyo. So the, the thought of making a soap was not only thinking about just the soap and most people would think, oh, you made a sculpture, which is a soap. But for me, they're called containments and they are containments of ideas. I made 10, we made 10 soaps, different prototypes, which can enter into different localities as ways of thinking. So the first prototype which came out was the black one, which contained charcoal. The way of thinking of the 08 Blackstone, which was a soap we made for Documenta, was to also think that a soap um, is also a, a kind of pact that is made between oils, that is made between the lye and is made between water. And once you get the perfect temperature, the perfect alignment of materials, then that pact can then be made and the soap can be formed. And it made me think of also the political situation of when the temperature is wrong, when things are um, skewed, when things are not aligned, then you realize that you cannot form the form does not take shape. It becomes very difficult for things to um, fit together to work. And so it, it's important for me to um, emphasize here about the, the charcoal and the oils. The oils coming from North Africa, West Africa, the Middle East and the Mediterranean, which share a lot of history together but also nourishes the world with its oil, either nutritional oil or oils coming from the ground. But at the same time as the same places that have been extremely charred, either through wars or through colonialism that has happened and is still going on, um, through um, environmental um, shifts and crises that are going on in these places. So, but at the same time, it's the same place that gives a lot of nourishment. So the sculpture is an embodiment of both elements, of both something that nourishes and something that also is charred. Um, we can move on. I think this image you're looking on is an image that you see that was in Castle with the performers that are being um, waiting to perform. And we can move on to the next image and we can just keep on rolling on the images. So later on, the, the project has also um, expanded in the third phase and the third phase contains different forms and different shapes. Um, in Athens as the art space, in um, Aquaibum as the land that will be used for planting and in the future long project um, that will be going on with the space. And, and also opening up of a podcast that is connected to Carve to Flow. But it's important for me to talk about the place that, what, what, ha what happens when a place is being, um, how to say, destroyed, when it's been um, um, in constant shift and what happens in relation to the people that live on those lands. And I think I'll come back to that notion of thinking about 
the death of beauty and how that affects the land that people live on, how that affects the memories and the DNA that is connected to a place. And we see that as a weapon in many places that have in, 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 in places that we live in, especially places that are connected to blackness, places that are connected to people of color, places that are connected to indigenous um, people, that these lands are always and most times places that needs that at the end slowly is not taken care of. That is the land that most times oil pipes will go through them. It's a land in which um, the care is not given to those places. And so that's why I talk about the notion of beauty in such places and how that is a weapon to be able to shift the way that we connect to a place, to um, make us, um, uh, to dissociate ourselves from the lands that we live in. And so for me, it's very important to think about how can this project, how can we think through the notion of creating a place that is embedded in knowledge, that is embedded with connecting to local materials, local um, um, understanding of the wear and tear of an area. And how do we work with that? And how do we regenerate such places? And the regeneration does not only come by working in the soil, but it also comes with the transmission of histories, the transmissions that come through oral history, that comes through material, that comes through the connection with ancestry, that comes through the connection with soil, with smell, with the weather, and to understand that these are bodies and they're shifting bodies and we constantly have to navigate with them, work with them, um, negotiate with them, and to care for these different elements. Because when we don't care for them, our breathing, our, our connection to this place will be disrupted. And so it, it means it's a time for a global call to start looking at the different uh, places that we're living in and to start seeing what can we really do? What can we really make? What can we really shift? Um, and what, how can we relate and bring um, histories and archive histories of our past and to see how we can work towards the future? Um, excuse me while my heart pounds in my chest. That was really beautiful, thank you. Um, and it really answers that question, the Herbert Reed uh, uh, comment about art leading beyond the arts to an awareness and a share of mutuality. I, I, I've been wondering if I would have time to ask each of you what the proper education for, for an artist who wishes to reach beyond the arts might be, whether it would be an education in aesthetics, in history, in geography, in economics. You know, where does it end? It never ends. Um, because the job of the artist, I think, is to is to explore knowledge, is to trans translate and transmit knowledge, and that I think brings us to Theaster's work. And Theaster has a very interesting combination of backgrounds as a potter, as an urban planner. Um, he is a, 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 an installation artist, a performance artist, a musician. All of these things that I talked about before, and um, it's not art about art. I think the art is really about about life. So I'll ask uh, uh, Theaster. I, I will mention in one of his in a 2015 TED talk, Theaster spoke of beauty as a human right, and I think that that's kind of what you're getting at too, because it's it's really critical. It's really necessary, and this carries through whether he's reconfiguring archived collections, advancing the scope of the Rebuild Foundation, or performing with the Black Monks. So Theaster, um, perhaps we can switch to you. Sure, thanks, Mark. Uh, and uh, Rena and Ozobong, thank you so much for uh, your beautiful reflections. Um, there are so many things that I feel like we could just talk about from, from these shared thoughts. Um, Rena, you talked about uh, the fruits of exchange and the, the strategies that we might deploy that might render um, our fruit exchangeable, 
you know, and I, and I think that in many ways, um, you know, Mark, when you mentioned my, my background in ceramics, I found myself uh, trying to think what, what can I do so that I can make gifts for my family for Christmas. <laughs> and so in undergrad, I took a ceramics class because I thought if I were to gain knowledge of this basic discipline, I would be able to give fruits of exchange all the time to all, to all my family members. You know, it, it's reasonable to say that one part of my artistic practice was born out of this desire to give fruit away. You know, we could, we could use that. Another part of the practice feels like it's, it's preoccupied with um, what I would call a kind of restorative practice. That is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with the idea that as Audubon has said, that things are left in a bad condition and, and systematic pressures um, destroy and wreck and create havoc and that in some way I feel like I've been charged in my belly to um, slowly restore these things. Now, it's funny because a restorative practice might look a lot like um, what we would call traditional development. But I've realized over the years that the thing I'm interested in isn't development at all, like to create a space so that you can make money so that people could live there and you change. But instead, I'm interested in the kind of um, the, the spiritual life of restoration. That is, what happens when a place was um, undesirable and one uh, puts effort against that undesirable place to make it a place of beauty? What happens when um, the gods of a place or the god of a place has been um, taken away and the temple has been torn down, is it possible to restore the temple and by restoring the temple, you actually relocate the divine? And in this case, the, the divine, like a, like a ceramic, like a pot, the divine is that moment at which people gather again and they gather in the spirit of beauty and love. So I think in that way, I'm constantly demonstrating um, what happens when one restores, okay? Uh, I think I have some images. Uh, you can start showing them, that's all right. All right, so this, this first image um, uh, is from um, the Venice Biennale uh, when, when Oakwe and Waser was, was curator. And the, the slate tiles that you're looking at in this, in this bell, they're from uh, uh, a church that was being torn down uh, very near my studio. And the, the church uh, was called St. Lawrence. And, and, and to see the destruction of this old Catholic church really hurt my heart. And so I asked the demolition team, would it be possible for us to create another team that alongside the demolition team cared for the materials that came uh, out of the church. Um, the demo guys uh, for a fee gave us permission to be on the site and they kind of doubled their money uh, by doing demo, but also letting us salvage from this space. So it took a tremendous amount of energy to clean up bricks, pull away these tiles, um, find the storage facilities, find the, the men and women who wanted to do this work. But in doing so, um, it seemed like the, the community around us in seeing the efforts of care became super excited about what might happen there next, how they could be more involved in the, in the um, reconstitution of these materials. It's almost like we created a temporary industry but an industry that was only effective in as much as the temple was torn down and then restored again. If we can go to the, to the next slide. Um, and so I wanted to be able to use these materials as a kind of um, temporary monument to the possibility of restoration. And that that restoration then the temple could once uh, fractured or once fragmented, the temple could then live anywhere. 
and that if we were good, if, if we were good at our jobs, let's say if I was good at being an artist, what I would do was not just be involved in the trickery possible uh, of the creation of an object, but I would demonstrate to people how they also had the capacity to be restorative agents. And whether we're talking about parts of Nigeria, parts of India, or parts of the South Side of Chicago or other cities in the US, um, crafting people who believe themselves to be restoration agents is gonna be very, very important. I would say, um, you know, to Herbert Reed's point, in a way, the efforts of restoration and reconstitution and redemption, those things might become more important or as important as one's ability to generate a work of art. So in this case, you have the redeemed Johnson Publishing Company's uh, Ebony Archive, um, Ebony Magazines, um, along with um, uh, uh, fragmented parts of African sculpture reconstituted to make new sculpture and then cast it in bronze as if it might live forever. Those spiritual codes conflated into a new amalgam, then kind of offering themselves as reliquary symbols of the past that are still loaded with spiritual power. Can I, can I bring these fragments together to do something uh, whole again? The next next image. And so we found ourselves uh, at the end of this um, renovation or the, the demolition of St. Lawrence Church. And at the end of it was St. Lawrence himself, himself, who was up at the very top of the church, maybe 60 feet in the air next to um, uh, the large bell that was the kind of call to service. And this concrete statue of St. Lawrence didn't have a home. Um, when the Walker Arts uh, Center invited me to do a permanent work um, uh, on, their, on their garden grounds, I decided that giving St. Lawrence would be an amazing restorative moment. Um, it would give the saints another place to live, but it would also kind of like uh, mark the fact that the death of St. Lawrence, his martyrdom was in part because he was trying to care for the needs of the poor. In that sense, um, the poetics of restorative justice and, and St. Lawrence's desire to say to power that, that the poor is our wealth. And I think that, you know, I, I'm starting to feel that more and more that the neighborhood that I live in, I realize that I'm not uh, uh, a missionary, but rather I'm um, a, a member uh, of a woke party and that woke party is simply trying to add as much restorative value as there is destructive um, power happening against us. And that if, if restoration could fight denigration, that, that, that then more might uh, join the cause of restorative. Go to the next slide. And so in this sense, I'm, I'm, I'm simply trying to demonstrate that the act of restoration then generates its own value, its own currency. Uh, it, 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 it makes people want to be present again in neighborhoods that they thought they'd never want to live in. It helps them understand that neighborhoods that were regarded as the least safe are in fact neighborhoods that have the potential for the most excitement, the most, um, um, the most fire, the most tension. And that that tension is actually what we want in, in an experience, in a human, we want to rub up against things that are, are unfamiliar to us and rub up against things that are familiar, but have those things presented in a way, in a, in a form that, that matters. So um, in a very different way, this project um, at House de Kunz, which was one of Oakley's um, um, last commissions, uh, uh, I, I decided that in this space where Hitler used to give um, uh, speeches uh, in this atrium of House Jakuns, it was kind of uh, uh, a, a fallow ground, an auditorium for the Stasi, that, that perhaps there was a way that I could reclaim, restore this space, which was in this case, 
uh, not bombed. There was no oil pipe going through it, but it had a, a history of um, complicated uh, uh, power dynamics between, in this case, um, the Nazi regime uh, in, in some ways giving command for um, world Is it possible to then make uh, a sacred space inside the space where Hitler was? And that through asking beauty to do a thing and using these codes that are from these places that are codes that are familiar to me, could this atrium become a place of my familiar, a place where I felt good about inviting my people, a place where uh, um, I could have some Harold's fried chicken and, and buy, um, a drink for me and my friends, and we have a good time instead of um, always, always having to go back to only this negative history. Could I start to put other uh, uh, combative uh, or complementary new histories adjacent to the truth of its past? And by adding things to the monument, render the monument less powerful. Um, that, that in a way I would never want to remove the fact that Hitler uh, gave speeches uh, in this amphitheater, but rather I would say, in addition to Hitler giving his speeches here, um, we also had an exhibition where Jesse Owens um, defeated uh, uh, the German regime uh, in 1945 and he killed him. And that race made uh, Germans excited about the black experience and this black man who became a hero temporarily in Germany um, because of his ability, which seemed on par or greater than the German regime. Take the next slide. And so it's, it's, it's super exciting to me that sometimes in the work of restoration, you're pulling things from the past to help make the present and future work. And so whether, whether I'm talking about archives or the possibility of um, reliquary objects that, that held spiritual power because they were enacted and they were, they were performed with, they were, they were activated. Is it possible to get these reliquary objects um, back into a place so that they might have the um, activation power they had in the past? So I'm constantly trying to load space with old power so that that old power might have new meaning and new affect in a place. So I think in that sense, um, choosing to value history uh, versus fetishizing history feels like something that I'm, that I'm really interested in. Mark, you had mentioned you know, that, that I'm a potter and it's true that I, 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 I took classes in, in, in pottery and ceramics. But part of the reason that I use that word pottery over sculpture, and I, and, I, and I go back and forth, but I use the word pottery because I think there's something about the nature of a potter that, that, that can um, see the possibilities within raw material and then do things with that raw material that allows or helps people to gather. And so my projects move between wanting to make a small vessel and then wanting to make very large vessels. And I think in that sense, um, uh, maybe I feel like a, a potter in the biggest way. And, and in this case now, brick is becoming more of my um, primary material and the ability to build, you know, um, Farrakhan or, or Elijah Muhammad would call it nation building. But, there's something, there's something about that idea that, that we could in fact be charged with or be called to not only make the work of art, but to rebuild the nation. And, uh, and I'm, I'm excited to be of, of those people asked to do that work, uh, if only asked by myself and my God. Yeah, one question or one, one comment you once made, I think was that you, one of the lessons you took from, from uh, pottery is that you can basically shape something out of practically nothing. And it's really interesting to hear you speak about these installation uh, installations as vessels. Yeah, I, I mean, 
I, I do believe that that um, um, Maria Magda uh, also has this ability, and, and I feel like we're in good company today because you know all of us are talking about the ability to craft, even to craft optimistic ideology out of extremely negative situations and environments. And so not only are you working from a place, you're not starting at neutral, you're often starting at negative. And so how do you take the truth of a negative situation and find in it or deploy from it something extremely optimistic? I think we're probably, if I'm not mistaken, we probably are about out of time for this part of the conversation, um, yeah. Yeah. correct? So maybe you could speak a little bit about about uh, the the music component of what you do, and then and then we can lead into Franklin's uh, response. Yeah, I think simply about music that that there are there are moments where the 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 gestures the gestures of restoration um, they don't have to be materialized, and I find that that sound and, and uh, not always music but just the human voice or syllable or sound or chant, that sound has the ability to also create uh, moments of restoration and sometimes restoration in ways that the material world can't. There's something very reverential about your work. Um, it reminds me of a quote from Angela Davis, speaking to Ava du DuVernay. It's art that can begin to make us feel what we don't necessarily yet understand. And I think that that's sort of the, the avenue of empathy. But I think for all, all three of the artists that we've spoken with today, empathy is only a beginning. That's only a portal toward, toward a greater sense of depth, a greater sense of awareness of all the forces that we have, that we have to work with the social, political, spiritual forces. So this has been an extraordinary conversation. And I would, I'd like now to invite Franklin uh, to provide his reflections on the ideas raised by the speakers. And after that, we'll have an opportunity for, uh, for some questions. Thanks, Mark. Um, incredible, as you said. And God, we need to leave on that note of optimism. Um, it is, uh, is an interesting time to be considering these ideas. And it is evidence uh, in this moment that we need this kind of art more now than ever. Um, I want to just, I want to say thank you to the panelists, um, incredible artists, minds, thinkers, Rita, Theaster, Odebaum. Um, thank you, Mark. And, and thank you, big, big thank you to Magda for the ambition of putting together something like this. And this is just a piece of what you all are, are, are doing. Um, as far as this symposium goes. And it, I mean, it, you know, as, as, as at my age, it, it reminds me of a time when we did this a lot more often within the sphere of, of visual art. Um, you know, I think we come together a, at fairs, uh, perhaps more than we used to come together at symposia uh, like this. And it, um, it, you know, it makes me pine for, for different times. So the ambition to do something like this panel right now, art, democracy, and justice. And one of the things that Magda has said is art mirrors society and is a testimony to our time. And that is what we've been given from these three amazing artists. And, and also, I just want to thank Marina as well and, and shout out our kudos to everyone at the Frist, um, Susan uh, and Fisk, and, and to Nashville for getting behind uh, a project like this. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, the genesis for a lot of the thought behind uh, the panel um, begins uh, in Athens and begins um, with Documenta. And, and I can't help but think about the ambition of, of Documenta 14 and Adam Simchik uh, for putting that exhibition together. You know, another one of these steps along the way or on the path of, of our um, lives that reminds us of the importance of art that, um, that, that these artists have presented to us uh, today. 
And, and also, um, Marina, thank you for putting us squarely in the present um, to recall the recent events in Athens and to think about what um, that means, not only on a very specific localized level where you can dig really deep into elements of fascism, elements of uh, politics um, that have a very precise presence there in Athens, but clearly uh, play out in a general sense of all of what we've heard uh, from our artists in terms of systems, in terms of structure, in terms of societies uh, that have have lost a certain handle on, on the humanist impulse that I think these artists bring to bear. So on one hand, within this moment, um, we are talking about age old pervasive injustice. We're talking about violence. We're talking about colonialism, imperialism, the kind of things that set the framework, um, but everything that changes, not only uh, the generations, of people that come after that, but what changes the landscape, what changes place. And I think that's the, the, the remarkable takeaway um, I'm given when I think of, of Brina's work and her persistence in a discussion on imaginary space and the power of imaginary space, something that roots into a, um, a kind of uh, creation of place where there is the possibility, where there is the ability to craft optimism, as the Aster mentioned. Um, we need that. We absolutely need that. And the only way, I think, in the face of so much of the lived um, injustice is to think in a way that is in the imaginary, that is solidly about creating um, artistic ideas, about creating spaces that are different from our lived experience. And Odebong, with her discussion on what it means to bring art into lived space and to use elements of participation, elements of relational aesthetics, if you will, um, to be a, a, to create a new structure or a new uh, circuit um, of, of meaning for artwork and its relationship on a very, very utilitarian level. I mean, you can't help but think about some of those images and, and the, the performative nature uh, of art that in many ways is rooted in different time, different space, when art is seen as a utilitarian object and less a commodity. Which goes directly into um, the Astor's work and artifacts of history um, restored in the present and how we take artifacts of history to find meaning or to give them new meaning uh, in our very, very different present. So in thinking overall, um, we also cannot lose sight of the very real moment that we find ourselves in now where we are dealing not only with the ongoing uh, elements of, of those big broad things like colonialism and imperialism, but on a more basic level, the things we're dealing with in Louisville, the things we're dealing with in Minneapolis. This is a moment like none other. And I almost, I mean, you have to think it um, remarkable or somehow prescient that these conversations have been generated elsewhere and in another moment because surely when I saw the, the title and the invitation uh, to, to this event, I'm thinking this is a reaction to COVID. This is a reaction to the killing of George Floyd. Um, and, and it's that and so, so, so much more. So we are um, fortunate to be able to use, I believe this time and space with these artists to think about how we confront the issues that are right in front of us in the present as much as we uh, consider the past. So these are the very real backdrops to, to all of the immediate conditions that we are dealing with um, throughout the world. And what a time to, to make that consideration. Um, of importance, three very, very different artists, though all 
guided by a desire for art to do more. Materials are merely vessels along the way for making the world a better place. And this is the, the art that we need in this moment. Um, I am grateful for, for being here. And in, in, in hindsight, I can see the um, invitation from Magda, uh, perhaps in relationship to other work I've done in art and spirituality in particular. Um, but this is, the, this is the, the time and this is the place for us to make a greater consideration and a more concentrated consideration of this type of work. And I'm happy to be here and look forward to uh, the conversation with these artists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Franklin. That was really a wonderful synopsis. I think it, it captured the, the spirit of the moment beautifully. Um, I believe now we have uh, some questions for, for the panelists. Um, I'm taking a look at them now, give me one sec. Um, for Rena Banerjee, what are the rules of nature in art and art in nature? How do you push the boundaries of these relationships in your work? Okay, so I hope you can hear me. I think I had a little trouble unmuting. I'm, I'm really aware that and nature is part of what we work with and what we invent in deciphering the difference between what we want to make out of nature and what how we want to profit from it. And so um, the things that I use in nature happen to have uh, two types of creations, ones that are very intrinsically close to nature, which is the handmade and that which is manufactured out of nature and creates a new identification to suggest that it's not a part of na nature. Um, what we sometimes ironically call man-made means it's not natural um, in the way that it was used in industry. Um, I use nature as a means of understanding why we choose to create such violence to ourselves and to each other in order to create a healthy understanding of oneness. And so I'm rejecting this ordering altogether as a necessary part of being together, which um, in frankness to the call of what you were saying about beauty is an inevitable beauty that we resist. The beauty is constantly fighting to appear, to emerge and to be transformative. And I think that some of the things that we talked about in the other artists' presentation was so essential to understanding this kind of flux and recreation or reclaiming uh, how we see our own language define and make visible what is natural and what is nature. So nature is often the possible playground by which we create violence um, and sometimes say that we are legitimizing the violence that of separation that exists now. Thank you, that, that was uh, a very thorough answer. Really wonderful. Um, the next question, I'm interested in the reasons why artists like Theaster Gates and Altabong and Kanga, among many others, look outside the museum or gallery structure in order to make art. What is lacking, missing, absent from the current institutional framework of art museums that compels artists to establish their own nonprofit organizations in order to produce art? That's a, that's a handful of a question. Fiaster, would you like to go? I was going to yield to Audubon if you, if you wanted to go first, Audubon. I was yielding to you. I was blinking. Okay, okay, yeah, you, yeah. Like, <laughs> well, um, I, I think pretty simply, um, museums are a necessary part of, of um, they're, they're a great part of the repository of human understanding and seeing beauty and 
but museums by design can't do it all. You know, they, they, they can't represent all histories well. And because of the truth of the history of the formation of museums, what they're born from, they were in fact not intended to hold all histories. Even, even though we may be doing a kind of corrective surgery now, the truth is that the encyclopedia was a very uh, limited one. And so what I'm excited about is that we need museums in our cities and in our towns, in our rural communities, but we also need other kinds of cultural and civic institutions that live adjacent to those museums that can say adjacent things, that can, can create um, uh, uh, additional truths to the, to the ways that people have been human and civil. And I think that in many cases, we have minor museums in the, in the, the, the dusty boxes in our basements and in our attics. We have stories that are waiting to be told. And the, the only difference between, let's say, a formal museum and, and the, the amazing histories that live in our file cabinets and curios is that one group of people decided that the things that they had were important and others haven't decided that those things are important yet. So much so that we would make display for them, that we would open ourselves to a public. And so I think in that sense, I'm really excited always when I have opportunities to do things in museums but I also understand that some artistic forms work better when they live in the world. So, so in, a, in a way, if I'm creating a political campaign, I don't need to do it through a museum. I need to do it on the streets. So I think in that sense, you have to know where your form lives best. And I think that there are things that I make that live best in museums and other times they live best on Dorchester. And I'm, I'm quite happy to put them there. I think it, it takes courage to do that. And, and, and so I just wanna encourage everyone to support your local museums and build your own. <laughs> That's a great sentiment. Uh, Atabang, how do you respond to that? Yeah, I can add something to that. Um, I, I, coming from a place that, um, um, that, you know, when we think about the, the sculptures or let's say the, the elements that were connected to the landscapes that are now in museums. Um, these elements were made for a group of people, for a community, um, for a certain um, nation. And they were not made in disconnection with the soil, with the air, with the wind, with the rain, with the water that's dropping. And they were made intricately connected with the people and their bodies and their sweat. And so for me, it's very interesting to be able to think of work that can shift through spaces, that can collapse, that can go back to the soil, that can start again. And I think that one of the big fears, I think, of our times is, you know, we're looking at a, um, different multiple kinds of crises, of economical crisis, where we see many museums have to even shut down and what happens to the elements that are in these museums. We have to also think of that there are possibilities. When I think of my own history and what I have um, inherited, I've inherited stories. And that story is contained within my body, it's contained within my blood, it's in my DNA. I transmit those stories to my kids or to my sister's kids and those, they will carry those histories. So the, the extension of the building is also connected to an extension that is linked to our blood, linked to people that we meet and they carry those stories that are transmitted. So what I learned from even making the soap was that if those stories were not transmitted, I would not even be able to make that today. So that history of transmission is very important. And that, in that way, it forces you to think beyond the walls of a building. It forces you to think, how can you create something that can allow for transmission, that can allow for another growth and does not look at the place of lack. That means we talk about why isn't in the African continent, there are not so many museums, but we have multiple museums. We have libraries, which are in bodies, in people, in written in stone, on the soil. And these are things that I'm interested in thinking, how do you extend beyond the space of the museum, which for me has been the crucial part of making my work and has created also the economy to shift it into 
other places that are not necessarily tangible, not necessarily um, material in it in that sense, like tangible material, but other forms of material that can slip through and be another kind of virus, but that shifts the way the, 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 we think and the constellation of things. And that's important for the future. That touches on a lot of the, uh, the points that are raised by the next uh, questioner. The next questioner notes the effect of the pandemic on uh, certainly on cultural organizations, but on artists and artists with social practices. Um, she says, I first ask about and put forward my thoughts to the local communities affected by the temporary closure of these spaces. How are these local communities surviving? What can I do to be of help? I would very much appreciate hearing from Rena Banerjee, Nkanga or Gates about any thoughts or insights they might have thought about in how we can reimagine in this current time, collaboration and participation that is so essential to much contemporary art. I can break that down into, uh, into bite-sized pieces if you wish. But I think it really the critical question is how do you and how do we reimagine art? Well, maybe I'll I'll just start with a with a thought toward my my colleagues that that you know what what COVID nineteen seems to have offered us was um, to reinforce the truth that nature is very powerful and that we are very fragile and that even even when our 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 big museum institutions and our, our corporate headquarters, even though they have very big buildings and they have helicopters and, and limousines, oh, and this, that, that in fact, uh, we are extremely fragile. The other thing the pandemic seems seemed to expose was that um, if we were to pull our mission statements away and we stop worrying about this anxiety of mission creeping, that humans have the ability to be extremely resilient and responsive when bad things happen. And so it seems like the people who were most successful at continuing to allow culture to thrive during this horrible pandemic were people who were freed up from the huge structural uh, confinings that happened. You have to get permission from the board. You have to get permission from your funders to change the way that you use the resources. You have to ask the IRS, can you change your mission temporarily? And that all these structures meant that it became difficult for institutions that may have had the most resourcefulness to be as supportive uh, as uh, agents as they would have liked to have been. But then there were other people on the ground for whom they've never been far away from catastrophe they're always struck with the issue of um, financial depletion and not knowing where the next quarter's resources are gonna come from. And in fact, these, these people are the ones that are so uh, uh, able to grapple with the challenges that were in, in front of us. And I feel like what, what I was, the moments where I saw big institutions asking, uh, or big institutions that were then proven fragile, having to ask the individual who was then seen as somewhat heroic. What should we be doing in these times? Those are the questions that we should be asking all the time. That, that culture should always be asking um, folk that are in fractured, seemingly uh, uh, challenging situations who are continuing to make great things happen. How can we help each other? How can I understand your point of view? How can you understand mine to make great things happen? Thank you. That's a, gr a great response and a great point about listening and about uh, opening the doors to participation. Do any of the other panelists have a thought about the question? Um, I just want to say that how much the crisis began to open up our vision of the world being very close to us and also our vision of ourselves thinking that the world here at home in the US is a world that is of one kind of person. And I think that because we were in a crisis where we realized we are not in cooperation, it was an important time to be truthful 
of how many ways we are not cooperating to become a home here in the US. And, and we're not cooperating to make the earth a home for all of us. Um, and I think people had to really think clearly about what makes them happy without the resources that became blocked by the crisis. To think clearly about what makes them happy. Even yeah. when these resources are blocked. Yeah. It, it, it kind of signifies that happiness may not be uh, <laughs> a, 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 a subset of, of materials. Material, yeah, material use and currency. We really saw the currency of the US become depleted, less respected, questioned. Um, and so it really exposes our humanity. We're, we're not the country that is number one. This is not a game. Yeah. It's definitely not a game. We have one more question. And the, did anyone else have a response to, to the previous question, Dr. Bong? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Um, I, I will also mention that um, they, there are places already that, you know, there are many places that are telling us what the future is. It's just that we're not looking. There are many places that are already ahead of time in relation to what we're going through now. So we are all screaming and barking in crisis, the COVID situation and all that. They've been other places and many places that have already been in crisis that are able to work through it and able to navigate and negotiate. Uh, uh, and so for me, it's interesting uh, for me in relation to even working, I'm interested in looking at future places or places that are in the future places that are going through ways of dealing with the air, dealing with water, dealing with things that in a place of comfortability you don't think of. So it's, it's constantly to be in a place of, it's not to accept that comfortability as eternal, but to understand that the places of comfortability can be the places that allows you to think with and for the future and with people and with places that are shifting intensely. And I think that is the gift I have gotten by coming from a place like Nigeria <laughs> or coming or living in a place like Belgium, traveling to different parts, traveling to different parts of the world is not just for enjoyment or for your exhibitions or things like that. It's to be able to understand place, to be able to understand body in space, to be able to have empathic relationship with people, to be able to understand that that place is telling you something for the future and you have to listen to it. And so in relation to institutions that are waking up now and saying, oh my God, we are in crisis. We've always been in crisis and we will always be in crisis. The only thing is that, are you awake? Are you kind of like um, looking? Are you thinking? Are you putting the, the fire on the butt to be able to feel it burn, to be able to understand that there you cannot sit down and wait that now you will stand up and say, oh, I'm going to have black people in my institution. It should not even be a thought, or I'm going to now have this, or the, it should be embodied. It should be part of the system. It should not even be a thing we should be thinking of. It should just be natural. And because we're in that crisis now, everybody's waking up to do all kinds of things, but it should not be a thing that once we go back to comfortability and maybe the crisis and everything or the virus disappears, that you go back to the same system. It's not acceptable. It should also be a constant thought within institutions, within board members, within all kinds of structures to be able to work against the kinds of diseases that have infiltrated over time due to the systems that have been in place. Thank you, Autobahn. Um, I think Franklin, for me, really hit it on the head and sort of uh, echoes what you're saying about 
we're always in crisis. These are the three artists that we've had with us today are artists who have been working for a very long time and really pursuing their, their understanding of the world uh, in a way that far predated this crisis, but certainly might have come out of another crisis and may prepare us to, to learn to live with, adapt, and perhaps thrive under the next crisis. So thank you for that beautiful thought, Autobahn. Thank you, Franklin, Theaster, and Rena. I think um, we, uh, we do have several more questions, but I think we're probably out of time, unfortunately. Um, I would love to turn this over to uh, ask, ask Autobahn to introduce her video, uh, In Pursuit of Bling, which is about a 12 minute long video. It is extraordinary. And I would love to have you say something about it and then we can, we can queue up the video. Thank you so much. So now we'll be um, preparing to watch In Pursuit of Bling, which is 11 minutes, 58 seconds. Um, this video was made in 2014 and it was made for an installation piece called In Pursuit of Bling. Um, the idea of the work was really to think about places of shine and places that have been obscured and how material comes onto body and comes into body. So looking at minerals, ores, um, looking at materials like um, mica, which enters into the makeup that we use on our skin. It brings me back to the times in the 80s when I would play with mica on the street that I would see glycerin because the sun hits the mineral and then we would play with it and put it on our fingers and use um, the leaves that have the milk from the leaves of the milk, the milk and the leaves to put over our nails and it would become like nail polish. And we would, I would play with mica without knowing what it was. And so for me, it was interesting to visit and to encounter again this material um, later on, like 20 years later. And I'm like, oh my God, this material, what is it? And, and it was interesting to expand just the material you play with as a kid and thinking of all these musicians, Diana Ross in the 80s, um, um, Bonnie M and the girls and and I remember as a kid we used to watch that and I wanted to be one of those ladies that had the shine and the glittering on the body um, but later on when I started looking into this material I went to Morocco and I found out that this material was used to chase evil spirits also because it would reflect the light back on the spirit but at the same time it's a material used in industry at the same time it's a material used in makeup the same time as material used in, in, in ions, in heating system isolation. So this material is so embedded in our history, but at the same time, so invisible. So I decided to make this work that really talks about the body, the swallowing of a material, the putting it on the skin, the relationship of value, the relationship to land, the relationship of, um, of something that was people thought was gold, was fool's gold, and, and then realized that it had no value, but then has value. So there were many stories around it. And that's the story that came about in making this video piece that you're going to see called In Pursuit of Bling. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody for participating in today's uh, program. Uh, thanks to Magda and Marina. And uh, please, please stay with us for Autobahn's video. Thank you, Autobahn, very much. Thank you, everybody.